So, Toyotaro, please give us something that Dragon Ball Online blessed us with. Dark Namekians. That and some other things. Hear us out. Okay, so it seems quite clear that for most of 2023, we are going to be getting some kind of iteration of the superhero movie within the manga universe. Potentially bringing out the likes of Orange Piccolo and Gohan Beast into the drawn realm. And thusly, going against the entire concept that we've been told that was going to happen. That the anime and manga universes can be entirely different stories, they don't have to replicate themselves. I mean, guess that might not be as clear cut as we've been led to believe, but hey, Dragon Ball showrunners and vagueness, they kind of go hand in hand. What plans does the author have for the manga now that the superhero prologue story arc has come to a close? There are certainly plenty of things that could be done, because we anticipate some important announcements for the year ahead on the back of retained hype within the world of Dragon Ball. That and because content droughts are unhealthy for the channel. <laughs> well, come on, we're being honest here. We're curious to see what comes out of potential revelations. Yet, even though there may be some hints as to what could be happening immediately after the end of the superhero story, what could come even further beyond that? That is to say, we are most likely going to see a genuine movie adaptation on the pages of the manga, for the first time since we got the very quick and snappy adaptation of the Battle of Gods movie, and the, um, uh, little joke regarding Resurrection F. You know, the one in which Toyotaro basically skipped it in the main manga timeline. But to be fair, he had only recently drawn a tie-in story to promote the movie separately, so I doubt that he would have really wanted to have drawn it again. As to the idea of superhero being adapted into manga form, the audiences split in their reaction to this concept. After all, we were really excited to see what could come after Granola, but then, no, we've got like a three-year time skip to then just doing superhero, so that means basically, yeah, repeating ourselves again. The more light-hearted tone of the book's final three chapters, though, did win praise from some readers, whilst others found it annoying and very much not in keeping with modern-day Dragon Ball. Even though in truth, Super's best moments were when we took our foot off the brakes for a second and allowed our characters to, you know, have a little fun. In addition to this, I think I can safely claim that I speak for the vast majority of the Super fandom when I say that the movie adaptations and other forms of media weren't exactly outstanding during the early days of the super anime. Do we really require a retelling again? Despite the fact that we are aware that the anime was different because it was produced in a hurried manner? Granted, this time around, Toriyama has stated that he had plenty of material in which he had to cut from the final screenplay of Superhero, so maybe the Superhero adaptation could be a lot more interesting and intriguing than some of the other versions that we have got. There's some things that we never really found out about and now we can. More elaboration. But that remains to be seen as of time of this recording. However, if we are going to follow Goten and Trunks, then why don't we present Superhero in a manner which is different to the regular versionings and adaptations of such things? Why don't we present the movie from their point of view for the entire thing? You know, instead of just telling the story from Gohan and Piccolo's POV again, why don't we keep the camera, figuratively, on Trunks and Goten throughout, and how they find out more about Hero's plan for themselves? Because in the original story, they just show up. What have they been up to? It would be strange, admittedly, not to follow what the plot is doing next, given that the most recent chapter seems to have left us right before the movie begins with the phrase, to be continued. Nevertheless, Goten and Trunks are, at best, supporting roles in the movie, so perhaps you can maybe build on that? Build on things, maybe? Could the manga version be able to extend our time with Hedo whilst he's in jail a little bit longer, please? You know, explaining how he came up with the Gammas in jail? I'd love to see more and more of how he got to that conclusion, instead of us just seeing Gamma 2 rock up at Piccolo's house one day you feel that there must have been something more to that. Do you see what I'm getting at here? What I think we would rather not have going forward for the next six to nine months is just a carbon copy of the movie. We might not necessarily want a recounting in the traditional sense, but instead rather us getting some additional information, which makes the manga a more enticing and curious concept in which to sup. 
more of an interesting venture for lovers of the movie to pick up and find out more about the things that got them curious and really fascinated with the entire idea. Some things that were kind of glossed over in the movie itself within the 100 minutes of the actual film. Of course, like with Broly's manga smattering, there is now the choice maybe to discuss the movie on maybe just one or two pages or half a chapter as a summary. After all, Broly's name has only been brought up once in the superhero arc manga version, and that was in the very first panel of chapter 88, and Black Freezer didn't even make it past the first page. But the question now is, what could possibly come after the conclusion of the superhero movie's narrative as a whole? So let's say if we did get the movie, what would happen then? Goten, Trunks and Mai, along with Hedo, playing the role of their gadget man, could certainly come up with some more superhero hijinks in our opinion. You probably already know this, but this short narrative gave us the impression that it was some sort of pilot episode for a brand new show, a spin-off you could say. One that was devoid of Goku and Vegeta fighting universe crushing entities. Something that could maybe be brought back down to earth to run in tandem with Dragon Ball Super proper in a manner which still could have Super Saiyans in it, so there are some things that we are very much familiar with, but could instead lead to more character interactions which were a little more mellow and less perilous, more relatable to readers. Again, we're not replacing the likes of Goku and Vegeta, but providing an alternative angle to go alongside the main timeline. You can have multiple things, and you don't have to get mad about it. You can not only give those four a cool dynamic, you could maybe add Shu and Pilaf into the mix for assistance. But you can also provide us some more grounded threats when everyone else is busy concentrating on cosmic things, most notably Black Freezer. It would be intriguing to study the hints from the pre-superhero arc that Hedo and Trunks would get along like a house on fire when you take the element of them being enemies out of the equation. These clues are very apparent, that they both love superheroes and Clean God in particular. They are both quite competitive and would be very keen to geek out about such things without scorn or ridicule. You feel like there's a genuine camaraderie when it comes to that topic. It will provide us the opportunity for the good doctor also to take on the role of the guy in the chair for genuine superheroes. Something of which he would truly relish if he couldn't be the supervillain anymore. He could even get stuck in on occasion, should the plot allow for it. After all, he does have a lot of drones like Hachimaru, which are super useful. And he has the means to actually make serums and buffs and tools that could make himself impervious to most weaponry. He could actually make himself useful and less of a liability if he got stuck in the battlefield, because who knows, he could maybe act as cleanup duty to get injured parties away from danger, whilst the main fighters could then take on the bad guy. He can actually just do a little bit of chores. Do you understand what I mean by that? And that's before we add Gamma 1 into the mix altogether, and have our heroes work with him to rediscover the joy of life following the death of his twin brother. Of course, Gamma 1 is known for being quite the straight-laced being, but he does have a moral compass and some sense of affection for those he cares about. This could be a good chance to maybe reinvent Gamma 1 for the future, to readjust and pivot toward a different lifestyle. Get him to acknowledge and embrace his affections for his late brother, who was more outgoing and he found at the time very annoying. Now, on the other hand, some of you might want something else entirely. Simply us just catching up with Goku and Vegeta as they get ready to fight Black Freezer, because come on, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's fair, I suppose. So, in this section of the video, what brand new information could there possibly be in which to yield a potentially galactic ending threat that could need our Saiyans to step in and take the reins of the series again? The provision of Freezer with a training companion would be a good start, as well as a second antagonist to assist him in his conflict with the Saiyans. That would be an element that would pique the greatest amount of interest among those possibilities, because think about it, surely Freezer had a training partner? Targama was the patsy that got Freezer to go golden, so who could have possibly been strong enough, dumb enough, and hardy enough to be able to train with Freezer for 10 years in a room of spirit and time and live? Don't you think that the third edition of the Freezer saga might be a little bit dull? That you really can't zhuzh it up anymore? And yes, Freezer is a lot more fun to watch now, but that isn't mainly down to him being the bad guy anymore. It's mainly off the back of him acting like an anti-villain, and now he's acting more like a cantankerous and reluctant old man and 
frenemy rather than outright enemy. They tried to make him the enemy outright in Resurrection F, and look how that's remembered these days. Not very well. It didn't age like a fine wine, something of which Frieza is rather partial to. Despite this, there is a strong realistic ideal possibility that they could bring back Cooler. It's common knowledge that the finest benefits may be obtained from training in the time chamber when done in tandem with a partner, another individual. Is it possible that that somebody was the newest iteration of Cooler? The canonically added Cooler? It could be an interesting way of bringing back Freezer's brother and putting him in the main timeline, as well as declaring the person who could realistically survive Freezer's gruelling beatdowns and training regimens for so long. And on top of that, we could have a black cooler to tackle as well. And you saw the difficulty that Goku and Vegeta had with just one of the bros. Whew, we've discussed this idea of bringing cooler into the main timeline in previous videos. It's something that we really, really stand by. But the easiest way to explain Cooler's absence from the series, for most people, after introducing him so late in the timeline, would be to have had him put in a literal Cooler. Well, I mean, cryostasis, technically. Been frozen by King Cold as some kind of insurance policy, or maybe as some kind of punishment. It's kind of unclear as to why Cooler didn't become the successor to King Cold and it wasn't Frieza, but we most likely reckon that he was maybe too similar to Cold for his liking, to be something worthy of continuing the Empire to spice things up. Because if Cooler was just like King Cold, then why doesn't King Cold just carry on? Hence why we got Frieza. Cooler could have been put on ice, as it were, so as to keep him from rebellion, or as a last resort, should Frieza have been iced himself. When we broached this topic in bringing Kuriza into the main timeline, we basically enhanced Cooler's strength to keep him up a little bit more with the story than he had exhibited in his first movie, and made him dangerous enough for King Cole to put him on physical ice. And then had Frieza, who was then more powerful, set him free when he had grown even more strong, or failing that powerful enough to rule over his sibling. And this is where things could go wrong, and lead to Frieza relying on the monkeys after Cooler basically betrayed him. If Cooler were to ever become a threat to his sibling after their black training, as well as a threat to the Saiyans, the younger brother could be forced to cooperate with Goku and Vegeta once more, like we saw in the Broly movie, in order to ensure that he would continue to live. It's essentially Frieza going, Oh, you think I'm bad? Just wait until you see my bro. Alternatively, if Cooler is not to be included in the main canon, well, maybe we could just have King Cold being brought back instead. His character might need some work to bring it up to date, but could be neat. Or maybe we could include Kariza finally. But one that went amok and Frieza had no choice but to eliminate. You know, family issues, very common with the cold lot. Because if we're going to be doing this thing with the next generation, with Goten, Trunks, Mai and Hedo, and bringing them into relevancy, then why don't we do the same thing with the bad guys and bring Kariza in? An additional possibility, albeit one that's more speculative than anything else, is that we could receive a spiritual successor to Boo. This, however, could be a bit of a stretch in that it's kind of a hunch rather based on something solid or concrete. We've discussed Frieza and Cell's legacy, and we've even got as far as the Red Ribbon Army being resurrected with Superhero. So I think it's quite reasonable to maybe pontificate about broaching this subject of this topic. In addition to that, there was a substantial tournament arc. In a strict sense, the Goku Black arc, as well as the Moro Saga, are connected to the lore that was presented in the Majin Buu Saga too. And yet we didn't have an adversary that could adapt the Majin qualities for a new generation, so that's still up in the air. Having said that, that's not the only choice available. Given the amount of material that we've been receiving as of late, our greatest desire, Habs and I, at this point, would be to incorporate the Dragon Ball online trope of Dark Namekians into the primary timeline. Our speculative hypothesis on their relationship to Zalama are bolstered by the fact that we have evidence suggesting that they came to universes 6 and 7 from another realm. Seriously, Dragon Ball Online is a goldmine in terms of lore that has not been utilised all that much, and yet came from Toriyama himself, so there is a level of legitimacy here. Check out our timeline video here for more context, by the way. In the event that Zalama is not only an arbitrary name that Toriyama overlooked, of course, and then is never mentioned again. Sort of like with Yamoshi. You could even go as far as to relate the nameless Namekian's evil side to the dark Namekians of the past. Possibly by him having come across some ancient artifact or something like that. That would be a really bold move. Some sort of curse. Although he would have not been aware of the relationship or of his heritage or anything like that, 
the fact that he was able to found his own demon clan when he split would make sense given this particular context and information that we've got. Yes, King Piccolo could be somewhat retconned into being a descendant of Dark Nanekians, just one that couldn't fully realise the potential of the original race's attributes based on the anomaly of splitting from a relatively benevolent person. Not to mention having little to no memory of his true powers, only recalling or using certain traits which were more baked in rather than learnt. Besides, Toriyama is no stranger in replicating characters from the online timeline, so thus adapting the likes of Nalak here, the mysterious leader and progenitor of the Dark Namekians, would have been an actual logical fit. We've seen the likes of Toa and Mira who were lifted from online coming into Xenoverse and the like, being used on countless occasions, as well as Toyotaro and he bringing forth the second iteration and variation of Yardratians. Why not do the same thing with the offshoot of Namekians, perhaps? Something that could be a yet another shot of vitality for the species. After all, Super has been very kind to Namekians in providing more intel as to their origins. Why stop? Particularly due to the fact that we would have had another giant-sized antagonist, this time with a personality, as opposed to those that are more kaiju-like in nature, like Hirudagan or Cell Max. And considering how powerful Namekians are capable of becoming, they could be a significant risk which would give Orange Piccolo some serious concern. To reiterate, they are the franchise's second most iconic species, second only to Saiyans, and it's very evident that Toriyama is interested in developing the canon surrounding them more and more, hence, why not? It's possible that Lord Slug might be reinstated too into the canon, as a mutant of Dark Namekians, rather than being another mutation, the Super Namekians. Not only could we bring Cooler into the main timeline, we could bring Slug in as well. And given how well the Moro Saga is remembered in general, this could lead to a saga with maybe several adversaries, which could lead to some very intriguing things. On the other hand though, we can't rule out the possibility that maybe they'll go in a totally unexpected direction. Maybe a continuation that takes place in numerous universes? What do you hope will happen in the next arc of the manga? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I will see you in the next video. Catch you later!